okay. Okay, it's, Debbie, can we have another snapshot? Sure, sure. Okay, okay, make sure you show your big smile. Okay, three, two, one. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the 2021 and 2022 our Journalism for an Equitable Asia Award. So my name is Nalin Lating Ons, Program Coordinators at Asia Center, and I will be your MC for today. And before I begin, uh, allow me to, to remind you of our webinar guidelines. So all participants will be muted and your videos will be turned off for these sessions. And for those of you who have any questions, so please send your questions via Zoom uh, Q&A functions. And any update from the Asia Center team will be put uh, in the chat box. And I would also like to inform you that we are live on Asia Center Facebook page right now. So to all the speakers, the panelists and participants, so please feel free to share the live on your timelines and within your network. And yeah, okay, so the award ceremony is uh, convened on behalf of Asia Centers and All Family Asia. And Asia Centers is a research institute uh, accredited with the special consultative status uh, from the United Nations Economies and Social uh, Councils, ECOSOX, and the center produced uh, evidence-based research and also organizes activities and discussion events. We also undertake uh, social media uh, advocacy campaigns on over medias and social medias. And often is a confederation of 20 independent uh, charitable organizations that fight against inequality uh, is also work to end poverty and injustice and create change that last. So in 2021, Oxfam reached more than 22 million people and 53% of whom were women and girls. Okay. So for those who would like to receive more information and updated news from Asia Centers and Oxfam in Asia, so please follow us on our social media, uh, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, and TikTok. Okay. So the Journalism for an Equitable Asia Award and its third cycle aims to recognize journalists whose work highlights inequalities and the impacts uh, of the COVID-19 pandemics on the lives and livelihoods of marginalized uh, communities. So today we are here to acknowledge uh, the work of top 10 finalists and the five merit awards. So our program for today uh, includes welcome, ceremony, uh, welcome remarks, the award ceremonies, uh, report launch, as well as closing remarks. Okay. This is our program, as you can see on the screen. And before we start, I would like to invite all of you to answer our poll. So the question is, how important is the role of journalists in raising awareness uh, on inequality issues in Asia? So, okay, so you have choice A, very important, choice B, important, and slightly important, and not important. Okay, so, yeah. And while we're waiting for the poll results, I would like to proceed to open this ceremonies with uh, the welcome remarks by regional directors uh, from Oxfam in Asia. So John Samuels, uh, the floor is yours. Dr. James Gomez, the Regional Director of Asia Center, colleagues of Asia Center and Oxfam uh, in Asia, and also journalists, friends, and colleagues from different parts of Asia, and uh, friends and colleagues. It's a great privilege to be here, particularly uh, in this auspicious event 
of recognizing and appreciating journalists who have been in the forefront of fighting inequality and injustice, and also reporting on issues to do with poverty, um, environment and degradation, and standing up for human rights, justice, and democracy in Asia. Oxfam and Asia Center welcome each and every one of you to this important event, uh, recognizing the journalists uh, in Asia who, were, who stood up for the fight against inequality and injustice. And this ceremony is for journalism for an equitable Asia. So first and foremost, congratulations to each and every one of you. We are very proud of you. And we are living in an unprecedented time. It's been two years since COVID, an unprecedented pandemic has devastated lives and livelihoods of millions of people in Asia and across the world. But also this pandemic exasperated the inequality and injustice in, in our countries of Asia, but also across the world. The last two years, 157 million people lost lives and livelihood. 150, uh, 48 million got into poverty. And we are living in Asia where we have been watching unprecedented levels of inequality, social, economic, gender, and political inequality. And this has resulted in a very difficult predicament. The largest number of poor people live in Asia. And we are also at the receiving end of climate change, disasters, and pandemic. And we are now, as we speak today, living in a very, very vulnerable time where the consequence of war may have, you know, will influence uh, economies and livelihood of many people in an adverse way, not only in Ukraine, but in different parts of the world. So it is in this context, this particular mission of journalists become very important. We are living in a time when media by and large have become more and more corporate. And there are increasingly crony media establishment in different parts of Asia, in different parts of India, Bangladesh, Thailand, across the country. So journalists who stand up for equitable Asia are those journalists who have the courage of conviction an ability to write about marginalization of different kinds. And standing up with women, migrant workers, and those ethnic, religious, and sexual minorities of Asia. And these marginalization, both historical, social, and political, further increase widening gap between the billionaires and the billions. And the paradox of Asia is, even in the midst of pandemic, the number of billionaires have increased and billions are pushed back to inequality and poverty. If you really look at the huge corporate business, they have increased the profit in the, uh, and wealth in the midst of pandemic. The Oxfam Inequality Report is an eloquent research-based evidence to show that how inequality affects every, the more marginalized people and the poor people. 
So we wanted to appreciate those journalist colleagues who stood up for justice, who stood up for equality, who stood, stood up reporting about multiple kinds of marginalizations, about the lives of migrant workers, lives of women, lives of ethnic, religious, linguistics, and sexual minorities. So hence, your voice is also the voice of the voiceless people. And your efforts are also the efforts to promote human rights, equality, justice, and democracy, and also standing up for the real mission of the fourth stage, that is the media. Thank you very much. And at this moment, I would like to appreciate Asia Center and my relationship with Asia Center go from its very inception for a long time. And Oxfam would continue to work with Asia Center and with media and journalists who would definitely stand together to promote a more equitable Asia, a more just Asia, a more an Asia without poverty and injustice where people can live in dignity. So thank you very much. Once again, welcome each and every one of you to this important ceremony to celebrate and recognize the journalists, friends who have, who have, who are being recognized today and we are proud of you. And we would definitely look forward to work with each and every one of you because fighting poverty and injustice requires more than ever a joint initiative. We have to work in solidarity to fight injustice. Asia, uh, you know, we, we are living in a space of shrinking civic space with unprecedented challenges to democracy. We are living in an increasing world of illiberal democracy where elections uh, often lead to authoritarian governments. So hence, our challenge is more than ever and only together, irrespective of boundaries, irrespective of institutional boundaries, we all need to work together in solidarity for justice, equality, human rights, and democracy. Thank you very much. That was John Samuels, uh, Regional Directors, uh, Asia's Oxfam in Asia. Okay, so now I would like to turn to Asia Centre Regional Directors, Dr. James Gomez, to give his welcome remarks. So, Dr. James, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, esteemed uh, colleagues. Uh, John Samuel, uh, Regional Director, uh, Media Lead, uh, Chiza Malik uh, from uh, Oxfam in Asia. Uh, uh, judges uh, for this year's uh, panel, uh, finalists, merit award winners, and participants uh, at the center here in Bangkok. Um, this year, we've been very lucky. We've got very good submissions. We had 150 of them across Asia. Uh, I just want to briefly uh, you know, share with you uh, what we have observed in terms of the trends in, in the way the stories the journalists has, have been packing, uh, unpacking over the last three years. The award is uh, in its third year running. In the first year, what the journalists unpacked for us, the audience, was uh, the vulnerable communities are the ones that have been most affected by poverty. And this is what we learned from the stories in the first cycle of the award. In the second uh, cycle of the award, um, we found that COVID-19 made that impact on marginalized community, vulnerable communities, uh, even starker. But what all of you have done uh, this year, uh, all 150 of you, uh, and, uh, and very sharply, uh, the Merit Award winners, as well as the top 10 finalists, what you have done for the audience is to point out that in the second year of COVID, 
this continued, continued languishing unemployment faced by the vulnerable community has stretched, has stretched the inequality. And uh, what we are seeing is as we turn around towards endemic, these communities that have been pushed so much back, languishing in unemployment, will struggle to even slow down the income gap and slow down the inequality. And I think uh, uh, what you signal really is that we need to keep the eye on the government to see what they can do as they you know, bring in employment for this particular uh, group of vulnerable uh, people uh, to first slow down the inequality, stop the in inequality, and then strengthen them so that they can get their feet up. And, and this is what uh, uh, we have learned uh, uh, from your submissions uh, and the stories that you covered uh, in the second year of uh, the pandemic. Uh, with that, uh, you know, uh, I once again uh, want to congratulate uh, the finalists, the Merit Award winners, uh, thank our partners, um, Oxfam uh, in Asia, as well as the judges for their hard work. Uh, and on behalf of all of us in Asia Center, uh, you know, it's great to cooperate with Oxfam on this award. And uh, we hope uh, to champion uh, uh, the work that all of you fine journalists uh, have been doing. So once again, thank you, congratulations, and back to you, Nadin Ren. Thank you, Dr. James. So that was Dr. James Gomez, Regional Director of Asia Center. So we, before we proceed, please allow me to share uh, with you the results of our first poll. So, okay. Let me see. Okay, so great. So 100% of you, so I, basically everybody thinks that uh, the raw journalists in raising awareness in inequality issues in Asia is fairly important. Yeah, it's really happy to, to, to see that. <laughs> and yeah, thank you for your participations. And next, I would like to move on to the introductions of our judges. But before that, let me share with you a little bit on the judging process. So this year, we received 150 submissions from countries across Asia, mainly from South and Southeast Asia, uh, Asian countries. And eligible articles were sent to the judges for scoring. And the scoring process was based on our criteria stated in, in the award announcements. And Okay, so now without further ado, I would like to introduce and invite our first judge to share with us uh, their observations during the, the judging process. So our first judge is Sao Paul Nisei, Editor-in-Chief Cambodian Nest from Cambodia. So Nisei, over to you. Uh, thank you, Nalin Rat, for introducing me to the uh, the ceremony and good afternoon everyone especially dr james uh, gome and uh, everyone who are joining uh, this program today uh, first of all uh, before i uh, express uh, my view on the the judging process let me uh, thanks uh, for the opportunity to be reviewing and judging uh, the works written by our reporter across the region and beyond especially uh, the Oxfam and Asia Center for organizing this event to not only uh, raise uh, awareness, but also how to support journalists who have been committed to do that, doing their works. And uh, like Narin, Narin Rat has mentioned earlier, uh, uh, this is a, 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 a process of judging and it involves a lot of effort from all of the three judges. And also, uh, frankly speaking, I have been very impressed by uh, your fantastic work. And uh, those not only hard touching, uh, but also it have revealed the ugly truth of inequality issue facing our people across the region uh, with different layer. I think most of us ex experience uh, common issue, but sometimes uh, we might not be able to see it within our own eye, but you all have exposed this and let us know how uh, you use that multi-dimensional approaches to uh, the dealing with the issue. 
And uh, what we can see from migrant worker who lost their job, the school teacher who don't even know how to deal with, or might be struggling to deal with online teaching uh, amid poverty and lack of internet connection and so on, to family who unpredictably have found themselves losing all entire income uh, due to job loss. And uh, for example, like uh, uh, Thailand, for example, the tourism dependent country, most people have suffered, including uh, different uh, industry across the country. That's the issue that most of us have experienced and most of our people have endured this painful situation. And uh, this is how we managed to set the life and on the undercover issues and allow the, the, the mass to un uh, comprehend the new form of, I would say the new form of vulnerability and eventually push for a rethinking and revamping of our response to the, the, the situation. Uh, you not only raise the issue up, but you also present solution. It can be practical, it can be sustainable, and it have the government do their job and respond to that. That without press and your works, I would say, we cannot uh, embolden a chain or a chain cannot be undertaken at the moment. So uh, that's what I really found from the work, but Dr. James had mentioned early years about what the works have been uh, uh, considered and it actually have been uh, exposing a lot of issue and embolden a change and solution. In the meantime, I also want to stress that, that uh, for those, uh, I mean, for other fellow who also submitted their work, but their work were not selected, please don't get upset with that because um, I can assure you that it doesn't mean that your work are not good enough or low quality. It is just because it didn't fit our criteria, the, the thematic that we focus on uh, uh, the inequality issue driven by COVID-19 in terms of health, in terms of uh, social issue and economics perspective and so on. Uh, I have seen uh, uh, some uh, a story uh, focusing on environmental issue and disaster uh, that all has been uh, that all have induced some sort of inequality and some issue might exacerbate the existing inequality in each society. For example, like in India, in Bangladesh, in Sri Lanka, and so on. Uh, it is really good story, but like I mentioned earlier, because of the uh, the thematic that we uh, the criteria that we set. So please uh, don't uh, be upset with that. Uh, that doesn't uh, necessarily mean that your work is not good. And so, so uh, and last but not least, uh, I would like to say uh, it is even more imperative that uh, our reporter across the region, including the finalists, including the merit awardee, as well as those who submit their works to continue to produce these incredible works uh, that uh, does not only raise the issue up, but you attempt to provide solution, uh, the enduring solution that could help uh, not only the government, but the community and uh, people to address the problem. This fast changing world, I would say with digital transformation, it requires all of us to continue to do the work better. We all have room to improve, regardless of how long we have been doing the job. So I strongly hope that and remain confident that you all will continue to undertake your critical role and embolden a chain, have at the fight injustice, promoting uh, uh, social inclusivity, and also creating a just society from now on. So thank you for all your participation and thank you to uh, the organizer and congratulations once again to those who have been selected for this uh, award. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Nisei. So that was South Paul Nisei, Cambodian. Uh, Cambodian is from Cambodia. So next, I would like to move to our next guest, uh, Termina Kauti, independent broadcast journalist from Malaysia. So Termina, over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Alinra. Uh, a very good afternoon, everyone, journalists, friends, and colleagues. It's such a pleasure to join you all virtually for the 2021-2022 Journalism for an Equitable Asia Awards. Thank you once again to Asia Center and Oxfam Asia for supporting and organizing this essential platform as well. Um, it's been an immense honor to have read and judged such a diverse scope of submission for this year's awards by incredible list of both veteran and rising journalists from around Asia. Now, of course, in line with the theme of inequality, threats to lives and livelihoods, 
I was particularly struck by just how many of the pieces organically covered COVID and pandemic related gender equality issues with such nuance and depth, all the way from sexual and reproductive health and rights mm -hmm. to poverty and vaccine inequity in rural regions. Uh, globally and also in Asia, it's already been acknowledged repeatedly that the pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on women, threatening to roll back decades of hard-won progress on the fight against inequalities between women and men due to, of course, distinct roles in economies and societies. And that, I felt, was particularly brought to the fore by quite a few of the articles that were submitted. Now, there is a clear need for a complete reset, and it's quite essential for permanent progressive policies to overcome Asia's COVID and inequality crisis, rather than a rush back to a so-called normal. And I felt that every one of your heartfelt submissions shed light and spotlighted human stories anchored by evidence as well as actionable solutions, which will actually move us towards such transformational perspectives during the second year running of a pandemic, which has placed um, vulnerable populations around Asia at immense risk. Um, some of the most pressing challenges which are facing the world currently, not just Asia, include, of course, the COVID crisis combined with the climate emergency, growing food insecurity, even mounting debt. All of these were once again also issues covered with an intersectional lens in the submissions we went through and which the 10 finalists in particular brought to the fore through their reporting. So when we speak of vulnerable and disadvantaged groups, it wasn't only women, but we also saw rural communities, indigenous people, migrants, refugees, the LGBTQI, who actually depend even more on us as the fourth estate to ensure governments are not just held accountable, but also assuring social change. Um, with that, congratulations once again to all my fellow journalists and finalists for your work and words, which are the exact voice that vulnerable communities need to see us through to the other side of the ongoing pandemic. I'd also like to congratulate Asia Center and Friedrich Norman Foundation on the launch of the report, Media Freedom in Southeast Asia, repealing restrictive laws and strengthening quality journalism. It's particularly timely considering the types and breadth of media repression and freedom of expression clapdowns all working journalists around Asia are experiencing due to a rise in authoritarianism, which of course has been further fueled by pandemic-related infodemic. Thank you all once again for your dedication, your insights, your steadfastness to addressing the gravest inequalities and human rights violations of our times through harnessing the power and fundamental purpose of media. With that, Nalindra, I hand back to you. Uh, Nipuna, I invite you to share your views on uh, what it was like to be a judge and, of course, um, a former organizer for this event. Thank well, you, guess, Shiza. Uh, I, I hope um, the Asia Center comes back on, on, online. Yeah. yeah, we are back. We are back. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for a second, I thought I was talking to myself. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Um, and, and it's really great to see the Journalism Award continuing for a third year. Um, and, and it's important to remember this, this idea for the award came from Oxfam Journalists Forum and Mustafa and I, uh, some of the di journalists um, discussed how useful this award would be. And, and with Asia Center, I'm proud that we um, kicked off the award and it's running successfully. And I'm also glad, although it's not easy, the fact that it's growing means that you have to judge more articles. I think we had 150 this year, which is more than we've had before. And so this year, as just as a judge, um, not as an organizer, this was quite a, a different experience. And um, I echo what the fellow judges said there was some really great storytelling um, and and what what was really uh, remarkable for me was of course we talk about inequality in big words but these stories made them come alive um, they showed how children farmers daily wage workers and people struggling to put food on the table are struggling and and even though i've been working in this sector and i'm a bit jaded by this and um, i was still moved i wanted to talk more about what you journalists wrote and, and do something to fix the problem of inequality. And, and this is how journalism should make people feel because these journalistic stories have power to move uh, people. 
At the same time, I, I do see challenges. Um, this is broadly and, and in terms of the awards itself as well. Uh, there seem to be a decline of quality on how inequality is reported in some countries. Uh, for sure, it's not the journalists who made it to the top lists and who are being recognized in this forum. But in some of the stories, I saw inadequate and exaggerated evidence, um, perhaps written with passion, but not really with the right rigor. There were others that were difficult to read, either due to language competence or, or more likely um, trying to frame the stories as um, they should relate to the readers. But these problems aren't unique to inequality. Um, I, I scan Asian media quite often as part of my current work. And, and when I do, I, I, I see some fundamentally flawed coverage and, and at times even from uh, top outlets. So there's a lot that can be improved. However, on a positive note, I, I think the journalists here, uh, the work that you've done uh, are a shining example of uh, what journalism that matters to people look like and the journalism that has potential to drive positive change looks like. And, and from the beginning, I, I think we envisioned these pieces communicating issues of inequality, but also more importantly, um, inspiring other journalists and others to follow suit. And, and I hope the work that you did um, and, and the work that you will do in future will inspire our leaders, organization, and citizens of Asia to come together and work for a more equitable um, and just society. Um, thank you and over to you. Thank you very much, Nipuna. So that was Nipuna Kumbayata, communication expert. Uh, Earth Rights Fund, Siyanka. So once again, I would like to thank all of the judges for your hard work in scoring and making this award happen. And we will now move, move to the announcement of the Merit Award. So may I please invite Shisama League's Regional Communications and Media Lead uh, Asia, of Femme in Asia to announce the five Merit Awards. So Shisama, over to you. Thank you so much, Nalendra. Thank you, Asia Center. Thank you to the judges and everyone who has joined us here today. Uh, and of course, a special thank you to the journalists who have uh, participated in the award and for your work in highlighting inequality in Asia. It's been a great honor to read your work and echoing what uh, some of the judges said and what Nipuna, uh, Nipuna said, I feel that for, her, for us here at Oxfam, uh, reading your work and seeing you here today uh, makes us feel like our purpose has been achieved and uh, the awards have been hugely successful. Um, I'm super excited to share the results with you all, and I'm sure all of you are excited as well. So without further delay, I will move on to announce the Merit Awards, uh, which are in no particular order. Uh, so the winner of uh, the Merit Awards are Arifa Johari from India for her story, Migrant Workers Who Never Went Back in Scroll in Congratulations, Arifa. Uh, we have Pooja Changawala from India for her story, Mysterious Deaths of Mother Daughter Exposed India's Neglect of Rural Healthcare for The Wire in collaboration with the Fuller Project. Uh, next, we have Noyan Huang from Vietnam for the story Inequality Changes Forces Fresh Gender Related Policy for the publication Vietnam Investment Review. Um, our Merit Award winner, Rafiqul Islam from Bangladesh for his story COVID-19 Pandemic Exacerbates Domestic Workers' Plight in Bangladesh for Interpress Services. And then we have Raka Ibrahim from Indonesia for his story, Alcohol on an Open Wound, Transgender Indonesians Struggle Through the Pandemic for the Jakarta Post. Congratulations, everyone. Okay, thank you, Shisa. So that was Shisa and I, uh, regional uh, com uh, from Oxfam's. And yeah, now we are going to hear from our top 10 finalists and the top 10 finalists in no particular order will make a remarks between uh, one or two minutes to speak about their work during the pandemics and their articles. 
So, okay, so may I please start with Meg Adonis? On the article, yet another challenging year for public school teacher uh, on Philippines daily inquiries on the Philippines. So, yeah, Meg Adonis, over to you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So first of all, thank you very much for allowing us to shed light on the struggles of the most vulnerable sectors through this platform. As with nearly every sector in the world, the COVID-19 pandemic limited the movement of journalists. Suddenly, we found ourselves confined to our homes, had trouble reaching sources, and struggled to work around government and health protocols. But the injustices faced by thousands of workers across the globe motivated us to trudge on and to continue telling their stories and seek accountability. In the Philippines, public school teachers are among them. For some context, the country was the last in the world to reopen schools in November 2021 amid the pandemic after 20 months of closure. This meant at least 1 million students out of school in 2020 to 2021 alone, while thousands of public school teachers worked for months on end without reprieve. In those 20 months, teachers struggled to adjust to the demands of remote learning. First, they were required to attend webinars, conduct online orientations with parents, and speak to hundreds of students through the small screen of their mobile phones. They shelled out as much as 1,000 pesos a month or around $20 from their own pockets to get internet connection, while others took out loans to buy laptops or mobile phones. On top of this, they also had to provide for their families. It's important for us to note that an entry-level public school teacher in the Philippines earns roughly $480 a month, but some say that they receive even less. A public school teacher I spoke to for this story was sitting in a nipa hut because it was the only area in her home that had stable internet connection. It was a challenge to speak with her given the limitations of a virtual interview. So I could only imagine how difficult it was for her to speak to 30 or 40 students at one time. With parents also struggling to supervise the learning of their children at home, teachers went on house-to-house -house visits to ensure that no student is left behind. Some of them had to ride on horses or cross rivers just to reach their students. But help only came when they were already burned out. They did all of this and other more grueling tasks outside their scope of work in more than a year. And as I talked to them a month before the reopening of, school, of the school year last year, they feared and expected the same challenges. This, as education advocates pointed out, is a testament to how little the government invests in education. To make matters worse, the, the Department of Education's proposed budget of 1.37 trillion pesos for 2022 was cut by more than half to 629 billion pesos. And so it is my hope that by telling the stories of our education stakeholders, we are able to tap government officials and the private sector to prioritize their well-being and to give them adequate support, especially at such a crucial time when we are all deciding the next leader of our nation. It is an honor to be recognized by Asia Center and Oxfam for this story, and an even greater honor to be among journalists who use their platform and their skill to amplify the voices of the unheard. Again, thank you very much and a pleasant afternoon to all of you. Okay. Yeah, thank you really much, Meg. So that was Meg Andonis uh, from Philippines Daily Inquirer. And uh, next, I would like to move on to our next finalist. So it's a, a, a group of colleagues from Cambodian News who together wrote an article on lockdowns and out of work escalation sets in among government workers in, in Cambodia. So, okay, when Wan Tafung, Lei, Sophie Wote, and Gerald Friends, and unfortunately, Gerald Friends couldn't make it today. So, I would now turn the floor to Wan Tafung and Lei. So, over to you, Wan Tafung and Lei. Thank you. Um... Good afternoon, uh, everyone. I'm so happy like our work was selected as a 10 uh, journalists, a uh, finalist. And let me introduce to you why 
we 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 wrote it down about that. As you know, uh, government work, like uh, government sectors, is one of the biggest employers in Cambodia. But there was already exploitation, mean that labor rights abuse and many workers have a lot of uh, that they struggle to pay their debt because of their salary salary are so low and we want to show how covid pandemic had affected them government workers could not pay for their bed or could barely survive when the factories closed or suspended during the pandemic. Many were afraid that what happened if they, they did not pay their bet and while the brand and the factory owners did nothing to help them. For foreign brand and factory owners have been successful by keep Cambodian government workers poor and pandemic made it easy to see. The factories and the brand was found the silent union still pays and export workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. As we know that Cambodian export more than 11.3 million uh, in government products in 2000, 2021. So it, it's still successful for them, but uh, it become clear that the, the exploitation in the government sectors wasn't an accident. Instead of exploitation was the reason the government sector was so valuable. Factory are able to hire cheap laborers, subspread workers right and make hunger a huge profit Foreign brands are able to sell clothes made by Cambodian for, for more than the salary that they pay those workers. So inequal, inequality in Cambodia is already extreme. The, pan, the pandemics highlight just how extreme it was become and the government sectors reflect this. So, when the COVID hit, hundreds of thousands of Cambodian government workers become very depressed. So that's why we want to report on this issue. And during that time, it, it also challenged us like Cambodian during that time to uh, 2021. The vaccine rollout is still low and lockdown restrict I mean that red zone yellow so uh, most of us cannot travel freely so it it is more challenging for us to talk to the to the uh, workers and even those the workers don't don't want to talk to us like it kind of everyone is worried and scared to get sick and another challenge for us is the information that we try to get from the government or from the the, the official who's responsible for that. It it hard for us in here. Like we try to, it really hard to get the data or information that exactly what happened during uh, the lockdown during uh, the pandemics. And. When we talk about the labor authorized, also hard for us to talk to the the government owners in the brand or the buyers. It, it's hard for us, and so it's all that we have during um, writing the story down. Very much, Wan Chao, and yeah, thanks for your remarks and chatting with us. Uh, Lei is also here. Would you like to share your remark as well, Lei? Hello. We can hear you. 
Yes. Uh, so uh, let me say uh, to all of you about the government workers in Cambodia. During, lo uh, during lockdown in Cambodia, uh, around 500,000 workers uh, have affected and around uh, 100 government uh, factory closed. The, the COVID crisis and uh, labor crisis have hit the government uh, factory workers hard. At the same time, they also facing this. This crisis puts them to depressed and while having no income. Government workers decide to commit suicide because of this crisis. So that's all of my article. Okay, thank you very much, Lei. So that was Wenta and Lei from Cambodian News on the article lockdowns and our work escalation sets in among government's worker. So next, I would like to move to uh, the next journalist, uh, Wan Wan Tan Tong, on the articles how to make a killing overprices COVID nineteen test for migrant laborers uh, on Russia ties from Thailand. So yeah, one now over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to say congratulations for everyone. Uh, and then I lost this article when Thailand list is peak number of COVID-19 case during that period, Burmese, Laos, and Cambodia. My gang worker will be in my gang worker will be in uh, target of state pandemic control in Thailand. This migrant uh, is like a second class, second class citizen. Uh, they don't have the same life as Thai people. This migrant have been work. This migrant have been working hard while being exploited every year. They have to pay 10,000 baht or even more to the state for the visa extension, work permit, and for being able to work in Thailand legally with the low, with the low income. After the COVID pandemic hit Thailand, many migrant workers lost their job, just like Thai people. They have suffered not only from direct of support by Thai government. The government also still took this opportunity to exploit them with the imposition of overpriced COVID-19 test. If we let this happen without investigation, migrant worker of the nationality will continue to be discriminated again under the government policy. Also, the Renewal of visa and work permit for migrant worker had resumed. The Thai government had not any assistance to this migrant worker until now. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Wana, for, for your remarks. And um, that was uh, Wana from Transfer Thai, Thai, Thailand. And before I proceed to, to the next uh, finalist, let me remind you a little bit on, on the time. So we, as we're running out of time, so all the finalists, please make it, uh, keep it a little bit like shorter, like around like one or two minutes maximum. Okay, so next I would like to move to the, our next finalist, Sanket Jens, uh, on the articles COVID-19 and the disparate life of India's sugar cane worker on toward freedom. So Sanket, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Asia Center and Oxfam team uh, for this recognition. Uh, and congratulations to all the Merit Award winners and finalists. Uh, it's indeed an honor to be one of the top 10 finalists. Uh, uh, so what I have been documenting the lives of sugar, sugar cane workers for the past four years. And with every passing year, it just gets worse and worse. And when the COVID pandemic struck, I knew that it's going to get much worse. 
so what actually happened is a lot of sugarcane workers they have to migrate at least a thousand miles uh, from their remote villages to cut the sugarcane and there are contractors involved here so there are no written contracts uh, you get an advance but uh, the working conditions are so terrible and so horrific that you will be paid merely three dollars for cutting like thousand kilograms of sugarcane and it just kept on getting worse and worse uh, so what happened is, uh, since the pandemic started, there was a lockdown declared immediately in India uh, in March 2020. And with this lockdown, a lot of sugar cane cutters, they lost money, they didn't have any money. So wh from where do you bring everyday food? Where do you bring everyday essentials? This was the bigger question. And they were forced into the cycle of cane cutting. So they took an advance from contractor. Okay. And once they got this advance, they had to quickly move to cut sugar cane. But the problem is, how do you cut 90,000 kilograms of sugarcane in merely three months using a sickle? That's just impossible and you just can't do it. And what does this mean? This means a lot of exploitation and the biggest impact was on the children. So all the children who were enrolled in school, all of a sudden they dropped out because they, they had to accompany their parents. They had to sign up for this work. And children between the age of 15 and 18, um, I, I observed uh, most of them started dropping out. And before the pandemic, 40% of girls in India actually dropped out between the age of 15 and 18. And this cycle just made it worse. So just to end here, the biggest uh, moment when inequality, inequality struck me was, so I was interviewing a woman sugarcane cutter. And she told me that uh, day before yesterday, 20 kilogram plank fell on my leg. Okay, somehow she managed to get an x-ray done with her own money. So there's no health security here. And after getting an x-ray, she told me that it shows there is a major fracture and we need an immediate treatment. But the contractor warned her that you can't go for an immediate treatment. Who will cut the cane if you go for the treatment? So what she told me, and this will forever remain with me, she told me that there are 100 more des days left for, left for me to finish the sugar cane work. So I will work for 100 more days and only after 100 days, I can go and get a treatment for this fracture. I can never ever forget this. And this... This is the highlight of inequality, the, the amount of inequality which has increased post the pandemic. So thank you so much, Asia Center and Oxfam, and congratulations to everyone. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your remarks, Sankit. So that was Sankit James uh, from Torwood Freedom, India. And uh, next, I would like to move to a journalist based in Singapore. So Shin Hui Cox from South China Morning Post on the article, uh, Coronavirus, why, why vaccines inequality in Asia threatens the world recovery. So Shin Hui, over to you. Hi, I'm Shin Hui from South China Morning Post. I'm based in Singapore and cover Asia for the Hong Kong Daily. Um, so for this story on vaccine inequality, we started work on it in January last year. Uh, that was really on, really early on in the vaccination drive, and, and it was within the first year of the pandemic. So at that time, countries were still going in and out of lockdowns, and, and the thought of having viable vaccines, were it offered a glimmer of hope um, for a way out of the pandemic. So when we started working on this story, um, the UK had vaccinated, started vaccinating people maybe a month ago in early December. Then um, Israel followed suit in Singapore in late December. What, what the desk had noticed was that um, countries with more money were able to buy vaccines early and start vaccinating people earlier. Singapore, for example, early on in the pandemic had used 1 billion Singapore dollars to hedge its bets on viable vaccines and, and it bore fruit. So Singapore ended up with Pfizer and Moderna. Um, and, and it was able very uh, right off the bat to say that it had enough vaccines for all 5.6 million residents and that the vaccinations would be free. You know, this, this compares to, to Myanmar who at that time had um, just enough doses to cover a quarter of its population. And in Cambodia, it was just 13 percent. So what it meant was that countries whose pockets are not as deep are a lot further behind the queue for vaccines. Um, what we tried to do in the story was to explore the impact of this vaccine inequality. Uh, this story predicted that countries with, who are slow to vaccinate are going to see rising infections, um, hospitals being overwhelmed and having to go in and out of lockdowns. And, and we did see that happen when new and more infectious variants came about. 
what we also tried to do with the story was to show that, you know, this wasn't just uh, a developing country problem or rich country problem. And at the end of the day, because of how closely connected the, the world is, it also affects everyone's economies. Um, we also covered a little bit about vaccine hesitancy, where places like Hong Kong, who had enough doses, people were not keen to get vaccinated. And, and today we're seeing the consequences of that playing out right, with high death rates, high hospitalization. So yeah, this is what the story mostly covered. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Xin Hui. So that was uh, Xin Hui's from South China Morning Post uh, on the articles Coronavirus, Why Vaccines Inequality in Asia Face and the, the World Recovery. So next, I would like to uh, invite Mario Rusenio uh, on the articles The Gold Trap COVID 19 is pushing more Filipino children into hazardous work, uh, rapper. So, Maria, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Oxfam and Asia Center, for this, and congratulations to everyone. Um, despite the challenges, given that the, pand the pandemic has a new Delta variant at that time, I decided to chase the story largely because our government has been talking about moving on to the new normal. But it made me think, who is going to be in the new normal? What is it going to be like? And how about the new normal for those whose normal lives are already bad? The children of Malaya and Parakala and Camarina Sur were freed from dangerous mining work four years ago. But the pandemic has brought them back to where they were, a life of dangerous and backbreaking work from which there may be no escape. The story of the gold trap and how the pandemic has pushed Filipino children back into hazardous work has showed how the efforts of the national and local government and even the NGOs to address hazardous child labor were pushed back to zero. That the government's target of removing all 2 million child laborers from hazardous work by the end of this year is impossible. And that the Philippine government has not tracked the children workers and the true number is unknown as most of them are beyond the reach of public services. So I wrote this story in the hope that as the leaders are planning on reopening the economy, and as we all move forward, no one will be left behind. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that was Mario Lucenios uh, from Rappos, the Philippines. And next, I would like to move to Lay Sophia Wote once again uh, on the article Trade Unions, Women's Worker Need Support During Pregnancies and Postpartums. Uh, on Cambodianists. So, Lei, once again, over to you. Yes. Hello again. Uh, uh, for the article, why I did bring the article? Because in Cambodia, worker, women workers, they have uh, many challenges. And, uh, during they have uh, finances, especially informal workers. Uh, the majority of the women informal workers, they ask, uh, work in the restaurant, karaoke, and Compensation they have discriminated when they have uh, finances. They do not have received the protection. Uh, uh, in fact, the employee at Nagawa they do to get the pregnancy for three years. And uh, back to uh, law in Cambodia, how many law such as uh, institutional laws, labor law, convention with the international labor law organization. So to help the, uh, human, protect the human right and the worker woman also, but the implement of those law is not yet too effective. Therefore, the women worker and the union leader insist on pay attention and protect the woman, especially during the pregnancy. At the same time, as a female journalist, I also bring their program to the public, though so that's all of my... Okay, yeah, thank you very much. So that was Lei from Cambodian News, Cambodia. And next, man, please invite Alphonse Alamu uh, from GMA News Online on the articles, The Hunger Pandemic. So uh, Alphonse, over to you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to e-meet all of you. Uh, my story is entitled The Hunger Pandemic for GMA News Online, and it is an investigation about worsening hunger in the Philippines. 
a literal fight for survival that was quietly spreading alongside COVID-19. When the pandemic landed on our shores, the government responded with a brutal lockdown. Although the Philippines was not the only country left or caught flat-footed by the disease, the quarantine, one of the longest in the world, mainly hurt the poor and most vulnerable. In mid-2020, a survey showed that a staggering one in three households in the country went hungry. Of this number, 2.2 million households reported experiencing extreme hunger. Now, these were record-breaking numbers and a huge story in itself. But because of the unprecedented global and public health emergency, we felt that it was not being discussed enough. One of the most dramatic manifestations of this crisis is the practice of eating food scraps or pagpag in Filipino. And the family of 13 I met in Manila who shared a meal of a few tiny pieces of fish. But aside from shedding light on the issue, we also wanted to seriously consider what the possible solutions were and celebrate the efforts of advocates and ordinary people in fighting for change. One of the main challenges of putting this story together is providing new insight to a long-standing problem. We explored the characteristics of urban and rural poverty, the viability of food banks and feeding programs, but also the need for fundamental changes to our agricultural sector to promote food security that is based on uplifting the lives of people and respecting the environment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your remarks. So uh, that was Atom Alan Rios from GMA News Online. And uh, next, I would like to move to uh, and uh, on the article platforms on it last legs uh, on Bangkok Post Thailand. And Barame is actually here with us at the studio. So may I please pass the, the floor to you? Hello. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Well, congratulations to all of you. And my article is about the sex workers in Thailand who was facing the vulnerable stage of their lives during the COVID-19. Even though the, uh, I have written this, uh, I have this, I have written this article during the second phase of Thailand trying to ease the nature, to ease the nature, to allow the sex to the, the night industry to reopen again. But yet, the sex workers are still at the vulnerable, still at the vulnerable stage, even up until now. And my story is about the COVID-19 affected the industry and sex worker lives well beings by using platform, the world, the worldly uh, the world, the world the, uh, famous district, not red light district on the world, as an example to vocalize the heart of sex workers. And the motive of this uh, of this or of this middle article is very simple. I just want to help my sex workers or friends. Which is Mr. Mr. Pawan in my article, which I have known him for around two years or three years already, to get help from the society and especially for the government. It is really heartbreaking to see my brother to work 24 7 as a sex worker without race. He had to take steroids to strengthen his stamina to serve it, to serve any as uh, to serve to the customers. Furthermore, even if my brother's he has he has like opportunities to do all like sex workers yet he has to face another dilemma that he has to risk that his life with the COVID-19 and as well as STI and STDs. Furthermore, many sex workers in Thailand has been sexually exploited by this customer without consent. And furthermore, uh, moreover, now even if the Thai government, even if to be honest, sex 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 industry is one of the industry that makes a lot of income to Thai, but yet the Thai government has not realized this fact. Still, they try to weaponize many laws. They try to uh, subjugate them as an evil, as an infidel of the society. Meanwhile, they try to ex uh, exploit these people and also their venues. But an interesting fact that I have came across last year that many sex workers in Thailand decided to, decided to end their life by commit suicide, which uh, because they cannot uh, because they have they, they have only sex worker as a carrier and they cannot find the money during COVID-19 so to, to serve their parents. It is a really heartbreaking moment. So the reason that I, I, that I write this article is 
to localize to the society and to the to the government or to any stakeholder that it's time to help this sex worker who is the co uh, who is a co uh, co worker who is a workers of type who can drive the society forward as well and not just those who are just like the things the the group of people that you see as an infidel or bad people they're just a, they're they're just a normal people as us and I believe that everyone in society regardless gender, sex, gender, race, and ecstasy, or the occupations are deserved to protect under the same laws. It is, to, it is the role of the state to ensure that no one is left behind. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, So That was uh, Paramit uh, on, uh, from Bangkok Post, Thailand. And next, I would like to move to our last finalist. So may I please invite Ke Keila Garcia, uh, on the articles, use your garlics inside money loss in formal economies on rap polls. So, Gila, over to you. So, good afternoon, everyone, and congratulations. Nice to meet you. Who feels your garlic inside Manila's garlic peelers is about the garlic peeling industry in the Seco Manila. It renders Filipino women among the least visible, worst paid, and most indispensable part of the informal economy. The story follows Maritas Arendain, a garlic peeler who, who earns 80 pesos a day or $1.5 for peeling a 15 kilogram sack of garlic. In, um, in an agricultural society like the Philippines, landless peasants like Arendain are forced to take informal jobs like garlic peeling in the city because of their gender, landlessness, and lack of rural development in the countryside. I felt the urge to report the story because I was angered by the injustice and inequality of witnessing the garlic peelers burn their hands peeling garlic the whole day, yet earn so inadequately. Our end the end situation is selling of a system that profits up from the injustice that marginalized people are facing every day and how we should all work toward changing these realities. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. So that was Gila uh, from Rap Post, the Philippines. And yeah, before we proceed to announce the top three prize winner, I would like to invite all of you to participate in our second poll. So the questions is to what extent has COVID-19 impacted the life and livelihoods of vulnerable communities? So, uh, choice A, we have to we have choice A to a great extent, and B somewhat, C very little, and D not at all. So I will spend a few minutes for all of you to 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 fill the polls. Okay, so yeah, so let, let me share with you a little bit on the poll. Results. So, a hundred percent of you thinks that uh, COVID nineteen has impacted the life livelihoods of vulnerable communities. So, thank you very much for your participation. And now, I would like to move to the part of today events that many of you have been waiting for. So, may I please invite Shisa Malik's uh, regional communications and media leads. Uh, of fans of them in Asia to once again announce our top three prize winner. So she said the floor is yours. Thank you, Nalindra. Uh, and thank you everyone for sharing your thoughts. Uh, it's very nice to hear from you, uh, your perspective on, on these stories. Uh, but I won't make you wait any longer. Um, so I'll announce the third prize. For the winner of the third prize is Fong Vanta Le Sufimondo and Gerald, uh, Gerald Flynn for their story, Lockdown and Out of Work. Desperation sets in among garment workers in Cambodia uh, for Cambodianness. Uh, uh, congratulations to all of you. Uh, the winner of the second prize for this year is. Marielle Luciano from the Philippines for her story, The Gold Trap, COVID-19 is pushing more Filipino children into hazardous work for the publication Rappler. Uh, and this year's first prize winner 
uh, is also from the Philippines. Adam Aralo, GMA News Online, The Hunger Pandemic. Congratulations to all of you. Um, Nalindrath, um, if you want to invite um, our winners to say a few words, uh, I'll let you do that. Thank you, Shisa, for, for your announcement. So now may I please invite uh, Bentas and Lace to, to give their remarks on, on the third prize. So Venta and Lay, over to you. Thank you, uh, Asian Center and Oxford for uh, recognizing this event and as we know, the reporting in equality in society is so important. So especially on the uh, poorest people and vulnerable people. So I hope the uh, journalists will focus on reporting in equality. Finally, I uh, hope that uh, SM Center and Oxfam that uh, recognize this even to uh, correct and motivation generally to report in equality in society. So that's all. Is it my turn now? <laughs> thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for Oxfam and Asia Center, um, to the Frederick Noman Foundation, especially for Vanessa, uh, for the opportunity to tell our stories, especially for uh, with Gila as well to Ms. Uh, Sheila Coronel for her patience and guidance, to the children of, uh, of Camarina Sur for their trust, um, to Ms. Arlene of Van Toxic, to Joe and Jason for leading me to this, um, to this career path, <laughs> um, to everyone. And um, I hope we will never get tired of telling stories, no matter how hard they can be. Thank you, thank you again. Okay, thank you, Mario. So that was Mario's uh, Rusenios from Rapo, the Philippines. And yeah, next, may I please invite our first prize winners, Atom Arrows, to give his remarks. So Atom, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I'm so grateful for the honor and I'm so very thankful to be among such esteemed journalists throughout Asia. Uh, special shout out to my uh, colleagues from the Philippines, uh, Gila, Marielle, and Meg. Of course, everyone is doing very important work and uh, my heartfelt thanks also to Asia Center and Oxfam for exporting journalism during these challenging times. I'd also like to, um, of course, thank my news organization, GMA, and of course, the experts, the subjects and the contributors whose generosity made it possible to put this story together. Maybe just to add one more thing, um, crucially, even though we may be already seeing light at the end of the tunnel uh, of this public health crisis, uh, poverty, hunger, and food insecurity will stick around for years to come. I think it, it was Oxfam itself that estimated that uh, it will take more than a decade for the world's poorest to recover from the pandemic. And while the mega rich have actually become even richer, um, there is clearly something wrong with the situation from an economic and moral perspective. So thank you once again for the honor and uh, hope to meet all of you soon. Okay, thank you very much, Adam. So that was Adam from GMA News Online, and congratulations once again to the top three prize winners, the finalists, and those received the merit awards. So before we proceed to the congratulatory remarks, I would like to invite all participants to take a couple of fill, uh, a couple of minutes to fill our survey on the award ceremony, so you can scan. Uh, yeah, from the presentations and um, yeah and now i would like to invite uh dr robin ramshalans executive director of asia center to deliver his congratulatory remarks okay so uh dr robin ramshalans over to you uh, thank you nalin rat uh and uh dear colleagues from uh, oxfam in asia uh, all colleagues here at the asia center uh, we were delighted to once again host uh, this award ceremony and hearty congratulations from all of us to all the uh, merits awardees, the finalists, and of course, the uh, top three prize winners and Atom, I see you're smiling. <laughs> Very good. So uh, uh, 
hearty congratulations once again to all of you. Uh, we've all read your heartwarming stories, but also, you know, uh, distressing stories, stories of distress in COVID times. Um, Please note, uh, you know, uh, as a footnote, that we will be sharing all of these stories on our uh, social media platforms uh, as we go forward. And please help us to spread the word about not only uh, those stories, but also about this event uh, on, on your platforms uh, as well. So thank you for that. Uh, I think uh, in addition to congratulations, of course, I, I it should be said that, you know, we are moving in in the world, in Asia, in our region, uh, to a stage, uh, an endemic stage of the uh, virus, uh, the life with the virus. And so um, it is incumbent on all of us to keep watch on the, to, to see how, uh, to how rapidly those vulnerable communities return to some semblance of normalcy. Uh, how are marginalized people re-engaged in, in, in gainful unemployment, uh, dignified work? And we also have to pay attention to, are they properly remunerated? And so many other things that you have pointed to in your stories. So thank you for the amazing work that you do. Uh, uh, we look forward to your stories about the recovery and how governments, private sector, and others help uh, the vulnerable com communities to uh, uh, re-enter the workforce, and in particular, or uh, you know, to 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 be gainfully employed and to have proper wages that will allow for a dignified life. So, thank you all. Please stay safe, not only amidst the pandemic, but also stay safe in an environment when it's increasingly difficult to do the work that you do. So, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Sawa. That was Dr. Robin Ramachand, Executive Director of Asia Center. Um, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, so that's the end of the award ceremonies. So please join me to once again give a round of applause to all the, uh, all the finalists, the journalists who contributes to an equitable Asia. So.